Hello, hello, and welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Ross Show. Looking forward to sharing today's conversation with you on so many levels. Uh, first and foremost, though, I want to thank you for listening to the last couple episodes. Uh, they continue to grow and grow and grow. So uh, we're listening to you. Make sure you keep giving us feedback, who you want to talk to, who you want to hear from, what conversations you'd like us to curate and cultivate. Um, it's been an absolute blast doing this every week in the college football season. If you've missed any of them, just go to yogiroth.com slash podcast. We have some really fun guests Jared Goff last week, Mac Brown, the Hall of Fame coach the week before, Dr. Michael Gervais talking about anxiety and depression in college athletics. So a lot of fun things that we're diving into, hopefully giving people tools that can impact your life. Uh, today's guest, though, is somebody who has impacted my life in so many powerful ways. Her name is Brenda Tracy. Brenda Tracy is a survivor of gang rape. Brenda Tracy is is an activist who has spoken, I feel like, almost on every college campus, team room, locker room, to student-athletes around ending sexual and relationship violence on that campus, and overall, in general, how athletes can be the cure to ending that type of violence. And she's somebody I met a couple years ago, and just to watch her continue to grow, evolve, and impact has been a joy, because I truly believe she's a paradigm shifter, she's a pioneer in changing the ways that athletes talk in locker rooms, changing the way that campus deals with sexual relationship violence, and opening our eyes to some major issues on college campuses around football games. And what I love most, outside of her sharing her story, is how coaches have been so receptive to it. This week, Stanford and San Jose State have a set-the-expectation game which is when their student-athletes will sign a set-the-expectation pledge if they haven't done so already. And also fans who go to that game will be aware of the work that Brenda is doing and have the opportunity to sign the the set-the-expectation pledge as well and be the expectation to end sexual relationship violence on college campuses and beyond. And for Stanford, well, David Shaw, he's... You know, he's the standard in so many areas of life to me. He's a guy that I've gotten to know over the last several seasons working for the Pac-12 Networks. And for him and his program, setting the expectation is a huge part of it, so much so that when every freshman arrives on campus, the first conversation he has with them is around setting the expectation of the type of men the Stanford men need to do, need to be if you're going to play for that program. So uh, much applause and much love to him and his program for being an expectation that Tons of other college programs have followed. You know, Brenda was recently a captain at Michigan, and so many other teams have really taken on what she's done and applied it to their program, to their student athletes, and to their campus culture. So I think you'll really love this conversation. I think it's going to impact you immediately, and I think this is a conversation that's going to continue to impact you as you go through your life and as you see student athletes, as you're around and watching college football games, as you're potentially talking to the next generation of leaders and learners. And for me, this is one that I'll always remember. So I'm going to get out of the way. This is good friend, an absolute pioneer in collegiate athletics, and somebody that continues to inspire us as she also sets the expectation in guiding us along the way. This is Brenda Tracy. All right, and welcome back to the Yogi Ross Show. As I said in the open, I've already got the chills before even talking to Brenda Tracy, somebody I consider an extremely close friend. I mean, literally like family. Brenda, thanks for coming on the show. So fired up to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, you got it. Um, Okay, so I like starting these things kind of like in chronological order of when we met. Uh, For me, I can remember meeting you at an I Am That Girl retreat uh, led by our dear friend Alexis Jones, and hearing your speech for the first time, and had read about you, had known about you, um, but when I met you in person, what I what I remember most about that, you know, kind of summer night was, you just have this endearing quality you that just makes everybody lean in, you know, and here you are on the front lines, you know, trying to end and you know really end sexual and relationship violence everywhere, but specifically on college campuses. Um, talking to student athletes and students on college campuses, but you have this warm side to you that I felt instantaneously, um, and I think it's it, it's interesting because you're you've got this hard shell, you know, that I think people see because you're a badass and you are on the front lines of these things. But you have this warm side to you that I felt in the moment we met, and I'm curious how you believe you you're perceived and how you uh, think that the people know you perceive you. 
Well, it's interesting, right? <laughs> because people perceive me in a lot of different ways. Um, but I, I think that I think I do have a warm place in me that I think that people feel, and I think that's actually just probably uh, my authenticity. I have come forward as a survivor. I myself have found a lot of healing in the work that I've done and the way that I've been received. Um, moments with Coach Mike Riley, you know, there, there was a man who shared my story. Just all, all these moments I've had um, in my journey have really helped to heal me. So that warmth, I think, comes from healing. Um, but there's also a, a mix of pain. There's a lot of things going on. But I do this work because I want to change things. I, I do this work from a place of I just don't want this to happen to anyone else, and I want other survivors to find healing, and I want people to feel engaged and empowered to stop this. And so I think that's where the warmth comes from. But at the same time, I do have a hard shell because, I have to. I deal with a lot of vitriol. I deal with a lot of people being angry with me because I have a voice, because I speak out. But at the same time, it's kind of like, I know what I'm doing. I know what my purpose is. Um, I survived the gang rape and the aftermath of that. So I think that's where that hard shell comes from is because I know I can survive anything, pretty much. <laughs> so name-calling, um, you know, people criticizing me or whatever, some of the hate I get on social, and it's mainly just social media people that don't know me, haven't met me, haven't heard me speak. Um, but I'm able to just deal with all that because I'm like, you know what? I've dealt with way worse in my life. I've survived to this point. I can survive some bullying and some threats and some name calling. So <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing, but you're kind of describing how most people describe me when they meet me. Um, but I hope that people continue to see me that way. I think that at the point where... If people feel like I'm angry and bitter, I think that's when I have to step back and be like, okay, Brenda, what are you doing? What's going on? Um, and, and kind of reassess, you know, my advocacy work and, and myself at that point. Yeah. Uh, I love hearing you say that. I mean, you, you are truly mission-minded, and, and I want to get into that. But for those that uh, haven't heard of your story or maybe don't know the details, and, and you share in these amazing talks, you did it with the Elite 11 in the opening, you've spoken on... I feel like almost every uh, major college football campus, let alone campuses that some college football fans wouldn't have heard of. I feel like every time I look at your Twitter or Instagram timeline, you're in another team room sharing your story. Um, and that the, the, the talk that you give to me when I, when I describe you, it's, it's the most impactful talk I've ever heard in my entire life. And I'm in the speaking community a lot. Um, but, but just to share a glimpse of, of, of your story, could, could you, you know, almost introduce, you know, part of your story to our audience if they've never heard it before? Sure. Yeah, sure. So in 1998, as a young woman, I was dating a football player at Oregon State University. And um, on one evening in 1998, I went with my best friend. We went over to another football player's apartment. Uh, we, we'd been there before. These are people I knew. But that night, I was, uh, I, I had a drink of alcohol. I believe I was drugged, but that can't be proven. But um, I was gang raped that night by four men. Two of them went to Oregon State University and played football. One was a uh, blue chip recruit to Cal, and then the other one was a community college type football player from California. Um, but I was in and out of consciousness that night for about six hours um, and, and sexually assaulted by all four men during that time. Um, the next day, I, I got up. I went to the hospital. I got a rape kit done. I reported to the police. Um, the backlash was quick um, because, you know, Oregon State football players are involved. It was a media story. So immediately my community turned on me and said, who is she? Why is she lying? Why is she trying to ruin these football players, you know, lives? I started receiving death threats. I was suicidal. Um, it was bad. And the DA told me I didn't have a good case. So based on all that information, I dropped the charges. I reported to the school. I wanted people to know what happened, even though I wasn't a student. Um, and then I tried to kind of move on with my life. Um, but during that time, Coach Riley, who was the football coach back then, he made a comment in the news that these were good guys who just made a bad choice. And he gave them a one-game suspension. So I carried that with me for the next 16 years. And, and during those 16 years, I tried to move on. Um, but you don't move on from this type of trauma. There's depression. I dealt with PTSD. I had a borderline eating disorder. I was suicidal frequently. Um, mostly woke up every day really wanting to die. I struggled as a mother, taking care of my 
my son. Uh, but I managed to get to nursing school. I, I, you know, I lived a double life during those 16, 16 years, as many, many survivors do. In one way, we do well. We carry on careers and normal lives, but in our personal lives, we struggle. Um, and then in 2014, I decided to start to go to counseling. I wanted to find some healing and closure. Um, and through a series of events, I ended up speaking to a reporter, and I went public with my story um, in 2014. And mind you, this is before Me Too. This is before, like, the Big Baylor scandal. Um, so it wasn't really a lot of people coming forward. Um, there was Erica Kinsman from the Florida State story. Um, but I came forward, and people believed me this time. And so that kind of just launched this crazy advocacy career that I have that I have now. Um, I certainly never thought that sharing my story would turn out to be this, um, but it has, and I'm, and I'm truly, truly grateful, and I have no problem with standing up saying I am a gang rape survivor, and I have no shame about that at all. Wow. Well, you know, thank you for, for sharing that, and I'm sure for the listeners, you know, you're just letting them digest for a second. But I'm, I'm curious for you, when, when you did give that you know, you told this your story to John Canzano, a friend of ours who is also a writer in the Portland community and a radio personality. Uh, and then you started talking to teams. Was there a moment, whether it was mid-speech, post-speech, on your flight back, you know, when you're walking around your community, when you were like, wow, I, I got something here. Like, I need to keep sharing this story and impacting, you know, young men and young people around the country. Well, I don't think it happened right then when I was in Nebraska. Um, it was interesting because I went to Nebraska just simply to find healing and closure and to talk to Coach Riley. Um, and then, you know, he gave me the opportunity to speak with the team, and I thought, wow, that's an opportunity for me to do something also, right? So really for me it was just about that moment um, in time, and that was really just about me and my healing. That was a very – I don't want to say selfish in like a negative term, but that was a selfish moment for me going there. That was really just about me and Coach Riley. And, and, and then I also spoke to his team, but that story went viral in the media. And so then that's when another school called and another school called. So I guess at the point when I had to make this decision was when the next school called. And it was like, okay, am I going to do this again? Um, and then am I going to do this again? <laughs> and again and again, because the calls kept coming. Um, and so it just kind of, after a couple of schools, it was kind of like, okay, I think, I think I'm going to do this, and I think I can do this, and I think that I should do this. Um, so it wasn't necessarily planned. It just kind of happened, but I have become more and more resolute the more and more I've done it. Um, and I think part of that is that I want people to really understand that, fortunately for me, I have this really bulletproof story, right? I have people who have corroborated, yes, that happened to Brenda. I have police going on record saying, we threw away her rape kit and all of her evidence. I have people at the school saying, yeah, the president told us don't talk about Brenda. I have the DA saying, yes, we had case concessions and we didn't tell Brenda about that. I have a rape kit. You know what I mean? I have all of these people saying, yes, this happened. I have all this proof and verification. And a lot of survivors don't have that. And a lot of people believe me because I have this proof. But we need to get to a point in time in our society where survivors can come forward and say, I have this story I want to tell and that people will believe them without having 50 people corroborate the story, without having to have a rape kit, without having to have a, a police report and, and all of these things. And so for me, being one of those people that has all of this stuff, I feel like it's important for me to say this really does happen. I am living proof that gang rape happens, that cover-ups happen, that collusion happens, that these horrible things that exist in our society, and you need to believe it because it happened to me. So I feel really convicted about that, and I feel not in a bad way, but obligated to choose my story to make a difference. Yeah, you, you truly have, and you know I've heard you give uh, a version of your your story uh, a couple different times in, in totally different audiences. Yeah. And to me, the the when you, when a, when somebody's an elite storyteller, it's to me when I can see the story and I could feel the story and I could visualize the story and your story as you've referenced is is intense I mean what you went through no one would wish upon anybody and I feel as though you you know you relive it to a certain degree every time you share it what has it been like telling and retelling this story has it been you know therapeutic for you um and then when it ends the line to talk to you 
is out the door and it doesn't end. I mean, we brought you to the opening and you stayed an extra day and a half because so many people wanted to yeah. talk to you because you impacted the best high school yeah. football players in the country at such a deep level. And what, what's it like, you know, for you to to open up and then open up again and again and again? Yeah, um, and I and I should say I'm still getting messages from the young men at the opening. Mm. So <laughs> I, it, it still it still happens everywhere I go, but um, it's hard. I'm not gonna lie, it, it's really really hard. I kind of, you know, I think for some survivors, they seek healing, and they they receive a measure of healing, and in some ways they're able to kind of move on somewhat in their in their life. And, and do other things and, and kind of separate themselves a little bit from, from that trauma and, and maybe even call it a little more of a healed trauma. Um, but I don't get to do that. I kind of have to live in a space where it's right at the surface all the time. I don't get a lot of distance from my trauma ever because I'm, I live in my rape and everyone else's rape 24 seven, 365 days a year. So it's hard. I have to do a lot of self care. I have to, I do my, my faith means everything to me. I, I pray a lot. Um, I try to make sure that I surround myself with good people. Um, I, I, and I kind of have recognized that I kind of just have to live in this space where there is a certain amount of, I think, um, heaviness and maybe even kind of depression that I deal with every day. Um, but I just have to make sure I keep my head above water, you know, I, because there is also a lot of healing in this, but I see why people don't want to share their stories. It's hard, and I see why people don't want to do what I do because it's, it's not an easy life to live. And then on top of it, when you have people who hate you for just having a voice and you know all the vitriol that you receive, um, it's difficult. It's very difficult. But at the same time, I know that um, – I was built to do this. I wasn't built to break. I, again, I survived the gang rape and the aftermath. I'm strong. Um, and I and I know I can do this, and I try to convey to other survivors, you know, they don't realize how strong they are because our trauma tells us that we're broken. Our trauma tells us that we're weak. That we're weak. Our trauma tells us that we're not worthy. But I've, I've learned that my trauma is a liar. Um, you have to be really strong to be able to survive something like that. And so I embrace that. I embrace the warrior part of me that survived um, that terrible incident and the part of me that is strong enough to share that story to change lives, too. Uh, that's going to be a quote I'll never forget. I wasn't built to break. <laughs> that's, just, that's, yeah. that's beautiful. Apparently not, because a lot of people have tried to break me, and it has not happened. And I, and I tell you that it will not happen. That's the best decision I have made. <laughs> yes, that's something I believe in. Well, I agree, and and you and you also have so many people that are you know on your construction team, you know, making sure that you keep getting built and built and built, and yeah. you, you it kind of caught like wildfire, um, you know, from the Nebraska, and I think there was a USA Today article uh, by our friend Nicole. Uh, I think she wrote a piece on you, and all of a sudden, um, as you reference, coaches are calling and calling and calling. Um, when that happens. What's it like for you when you go in to these team rooms? Because I'd imagine, you know, being a former coach, there's an element of, I don't know how to talk to my kids about this. There's an element of, let's bring in outside voices because they hear us every day. There's an element of, of course, there's not a, a, a soul, at least I'd like to believe in the world, that's mentoring and guiding the next generation of leaders and learners that is saying, you know, any type of this behavior is okay. So you've got people on your side, but I, I'm sure there's also a part of like, you know, uncertainty or unknowing or maybe unsettling when, when a coach brings you in because they themselves may not really know how to operate, you know, around a survivor like yourself. So what what was that like early on when you started receiving those calls? Well, I can tell you that it's interesting because I thought that this would get easier as I went. I thought that it would kind of change as I went along and the more teams I visited and the more and more I did this. Um, but in some ways, nothing has changed. Like, I, I I thought in the beginning, I thought, okay, Brenda, when I was at Nebraska, I cried while I shared the details of what happened to me in the apartment. And then, and I and I cried this, a few times after that, and I thought, okay, you'll get stronger. You, you won't cry. You'll get used to it. Um, but I still cry to this day, <laughs> like 75 times later. Um, it hasn't changed. It, it still feels gut-wrenching and awful to share the details of that apartment. So that hasn't changed at all. 
the fear before walking into the room and standing in front of these young men is exactly the same. I feel a little nauseous every single time. Um, and I think that's just because no matter what, I'm, in, I'm standing in front of a room full of men, which in itself is terrifying, right? They're men, they're football players, they're athletes, um, and they're strangers. So I, I really don't know. I mean, coaches bring me in, but I don't know how I'm going to be received. I don't know if these people are going to push back on me. I don't know if they're going to call me a liar. I don't know if they're going to embrace me. I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know until the end, right? Like, so it, it's terrifying every single time, and I thought all of that would change, um, but it hasn't changed, and, I, and so I have to step out in faith every single time. Um, it's very emotional, and but the thing that has changed is my resolve. My, 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 my resolve has deepened. My resolve has not changed, and I feel confident in yes, you're afraid, but do it anyway. And, I, and I, so I just push past that fear. And it's gotten easier for me to push past the fear, but it's not that I don't feel it. I mm. just don't let it control me. Yeah. No, that, yeah. A, a friend of mine who was a, a dynamic athlete in her time, she said, feel the fear and do it anyway. And I've always remembered yeah. that thought. Um, I'm, I want to take you back, though, to I believe it was two Aprils ago, and you find yourself in Northern California, on the campus of Stanford, which to me is just a leader in so many ways, right? You listen to David Shaw's TED Talk about how football can change the world. You meet people on his staff. Uh, You meet people on his administrative staff. I've called a bunch of their games. I was just there a couple weeks ago on the Pac-12 Network. And you spoke to his team. I'm curious uh, what that experience was like because I I think, at least from an outsider's perspective and, and a close friend of yours, that like that speech may have you know, been one of those paradigm shifters in your voice, in your career to get you to a larger platform. But what was that day like? And then even the moments afterwards when you were talking to Coach Shaw before you boarded your plane and and headed back home. Yeah, that was insane. Um, And that was interesting because that month that I first met the team and Coach Shaw, that month was when I launched the Set the Expectation campaign. So the campaign just started as a pledge. I was just trying to get coaches on the same page and say, hey, your behavior matters. And if you do these things to harm another person, you don't get to play sports for me. And so I just launched the pledge. I was scheduled to speak at Stanford. And it was interesting because the, the program was like, not only do we want you to come speak, but we want to sign the pledge. Well, like, we want to do it right then while you're there. And I was like, well, you don't want to look at it first. You want to hear me speak first and then make a decision. They're like, no, we want to do it now. And I was like, oh, my gosh, okay, great. <laughs> because the idea that a, that a team would be and a coach would be still on board before he even heard my story, or, or met me or, or saw me in person was um, kind of unreal to me at the time. Um, so I got there, I met Coach Shaw, and everything about us was just on the same page. I, I was talking about the Paris sports. He was talking about the Paris sports. We were talking about influence. He was talking about influence and stages. You know what I mean? Like, we were practically finishing each other's sentences. And so it, it was incredible. And then I went into the team room and I, and I worked with the team and you could just see the trickle down, you know, leadership into the team about how they responded to me. And they were so ready to sign the pledge and Coach Shaw led that room. It was a pivotal moment, absolutely, um, in my career. And, you know, that day it was like, okay, and we're going to do a game. We're going to use this campaign to raise awareness. We're going to use our influence and our power for good. Two days later, it was in April, so April Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Two days later, a bunch of the football guys showed up at Take Back the Night, which is normally only, usually attended by women and sometimes men, but a lot of people, there, you know, there's a group of people who kind of sing to the choir, right? They already kind of know all these things. Um, but to have the football players showed up, they're like, oh, my gosh, this is the first time football's ever showed up for anything that we've been doing. So it was incredible, and it, you're right. It was a kind of a watershed moment for me. I think that they... The fact that they stepped up showed other schools we could do it too. If Stanford is doing it, we can do it too. And I talk a lot to programs about that because there's a fundamental belief that I have, and that's that when one man stands up, you know, and takes a stand, he gets permission to another man to do the same, and another, and another, and another. And it's the same with our football programs and our coaches. When one coach takes a stand, he gives permission to another to do it. And when one program takes a stand, they give permission to another to do it. And that's kind of how you start a movement, right? One by one by one by one. Wow, that's that's so true. Um, and I, okay, so that happens in April, and then last football season occurs, and 
you know, I, I talk to their staff, I'll go there for training camp. Callie Dale is uh, a close friend of, of both of ours. She's an assistant Lover. athletics director, uh, head of football operations and student athlete well-being. And her and Matt Doyle, um, you know, those two kind of leading the charge in that football department, at least on the administrative side, doing so many incredible things. And all of a sudden, you go from being a guest speaker to having a game dedicated in your honor. In fact, the first game in the history of college football is over 100 years old, dedicated yeah. to ending sexual and relationship violence on college campuses. What, what is that phone call like when you're told this is happening after you just knock out your, you know, oh, incredible I speech? <laughs> I mean, I cried. I cried. I did a lot of crying during that time. Um, and I still do some crying <laughs> when I see what Stanford is doing. Um, but it's, it's overly emotional and wonderful. And, and I think the important thing, too, is that, you know, we weren't necessarily at that moment feeling like immersed in a sexual assault scandal with the football team right in that moment, right? Like Stanford has definitely had their issues and things, but it's not like it was, you know, a Baylor scandal and they decided to have a game. No, this was, this was a team saying like, we want to be the solution. Like no matter what, if we've had a problem, if there is a problem, if there's going to be a problem in the future, we're going to be the solution. And it just was really phenomenal. And it, it all of these things that happen. You know, it was a full circle moment for me. Um, and as hard as this work is, it, it makes it all worth it. You know, these moments make it worth it to stand in front of a room and tear open my wound day after day after day. Um, and to, you know, work so hard on my self-care and keep my head above water and, you know, all these things. These are the moments that really make it worth it. And, and I hear the stories that come from these games, right? You have a a, a player who talked to their mom about the game and me, and then the mom disclosed that they're rape survivor. Or I don't know. There's just so many things that happen that we don't know about. The ripple effect is incredible, and um, it's pretty unreal. And it's, I feel kind of like I'm outside my body a lot. <laughs> like this is so surreal. This is really happening <laughs> um, because it's really kind of unbelievable when I think about where I've been to what's happening now, and I'm. So grateful for Stanford. Coach Shaw is amazing. Callie's amazing. The staff is amazing. The players are amazing. Um, amazing program. So proud of those guys. Yeah, I can remember when that happened, you know, as the universe conspired for us. You know, I had a chance to, and was lucky enough to call that game on the Pac-12 network, which was yes. just, a, a, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Um, but but I, I look back at that moment, and now here we are a year later, and you've got uh, not only one set the expectation game, this week in Stanford and Utah, but also San Jose State and Coach Brent Brennan, a, a good friend of this show and, and us as well. He has a game titled Set the Expectation. And in between, if you go back to last year's game against Arizona State, um, nobody really knew what to do with Set the Expectation game. Like it was featured on ESPN and Sports Center. Obviously, we covered it in our game. But overall, like it was it was new to the media. It was kind of like when People started running out of the shotgun and the spread offense. People were like, whoa, what, what's happening in college football? And between then and now, you know, and, and I'm not going to get all of these, but you have an entire conference who's taken on your initiative in college athletics. You've been a captain at Michigan with Jim Harbaugh. You've raised money with GoFundMe campaigns for communities who have set the expectation games. I mean, this went from, oh, my God, thank you. I'm crying. Thank you, Stanford. This is insane to this is now kind of the norm. And now it's, I, I can only imagine your calendar about which game, which week, which team is having a set the expectation game. And here we go again. I'm curious if you can just, you know, step out of your body for a second and be like, wow, in one calendar year, it went from being, how do I deal with Brenda and a set the expectation game to, hey, when can we get a set the expectation game? <laughs> it's insane, right? Because on top of all that too, uh, the big guy also implemented that, uh, policy for serious misconduct, um, which is the first of the kind of the nation. Um, but yeah, I, I, now I get notifications on Twitter, like, oh, we're having a game. And I'm like, oh my gosh, who, what is this school? And who is this school? <laughs> I don't know anything about this. Um, and I've also launched the expectation of a nonprofit. So it's, you're right. It's very insane um, what's happened in, in a year. Um, and it all sparked from that Stanford game. And it is, it is becoming a movement. And it is becoming um, kind of the norm. And, and I hope that that happens. And the campaign is gaining momentum. And I hope that it does so because this is something all of us should be doing. There's really nothing more 
important. And these are the issues facing our kids on our campuses and in our communities. Domestic violence, sexual assault, harassment, these types of things are so rampant in all of our communities and on our campuses. These are the things we really should be talking about. These are the things we should be raising money for. These are the things we should be putting our resources into. These are the things we should be engaging people on and having conversations, taking away the stigma, the shame, preventing education. These are the these are the issues that we need to be talking about and dealing with. And it's exciting to see the campaign doing that and kind of in a fun way, right? Sexual assault and domestic violence can be really daunting, hard, difficult issues. But there's something about being in a set the expectation game and honoring survivors and having fun, right? Like we can have a good time and set the expectation. We can celebrate each other. We can honor survivors. We can celebrate the courage. And, and we can take away the stigma and the shame and say to people like, yeah, you're a young man who grew up in a home with domestic violence, but guess what? You have nothing to be ashamed about. And that affected your life adversely, and you may be dealing with depression, and you may have thought about committing suicide at one time, but guess what? You're a survivor, too. And we're going to have a game today, and we're going to honor you. And it's okay to share your story, and it's okay to give people hugs. You know what I mean? Like, there's something positive about it that I think is amazing, too. And I, and I love that part of the campaign, and I love that part of the game. So explain the campaign for people. I mean, we say set the expectation, we see the hashtag, but but what happens? I mean, every school I imagine does their own individual twist on it. Uh, but generally, w- what is the campaign? So the campaign is set the expectation that sexual assault and physical violence are never okay. That's that's the whole that's the whole line for it. Um, and then what we do really set the expectation focuses on men and engaging and educating men as the solution. Um, I learned very early on that sexual violence is mainly committed by men. Like 98% of all sexual violence is committed by men. So that makes it a men's issue, not a women's issue. Um, But unfortunately, what we see in our society is women working on this issue. Women trying to end violence against women, and that can't happen. Men have to join in the fight. So that expectation is really geared towards men. It's geared towards athletes and, and coaches being the solution. It's a very positive message of how to get involved. Um, and we use the Set Expectation campaign and the purple and teal ribbon to raise awareness um, about about these issues and getting men involved and engaged. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what it's about. I know that's kind of, I need to get a better mission statement, <laughs> but that's kind of really what it's about. It's really about just setting the expectation that sexual assault and physical violence are never okay and engaging men as the solution. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's just, it's a simple concept of, you know, and I know we've talked about it, Alexis Jones and, you know, her program protector, you guys collaborated on items where, look, be the, be the solution. And I think to me, that's always uh, one of my favorite lines where I get to introduce you guys or talk about you of, you know, student athletes and men don't need to be the only the problem to be the point of the statistic, you know, we can be the solution. So um, on that note, can you share some of the statistics? Because I think when listeners hear them around sexual violence on college campuses, it's like, whoa, what? can you say that one more time? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of important statistics. Um, you know, one of them I just mentioned was that 98% of all sexual violence is carried out by men. They're, they're the ones perpetrating this violence against men, women, and children. But it's important to make the distinction that it's not 98% of all of our men, right? It's 10% of our male population committing these crimes, which means 90% of our men are good guys. They're not doing this. The problem is that they're not realizing that they're the solution. They're not realizing the things they get involved, um, and they're silent, right? There's a lot of men who are silent, and they just go along with things. Um, so really, for me, it's about engaging that 90% of those men. And then also engaging women, too, right? Because if it's 10% of our population committing these crimes, then... The other 90% needs to get together. Men and women need to get together and push back on the 10%. Because the 10% are responsible for one in five women being uh, sexually assaulted during their time in college, one in four, actually one in three or four women in a, in a lifetime, um, one in four girls being sexually abused before the age of 18, one in six boys, I think that's a really important one, one in six boys are sexually abused before they're 18. That's a huge number. Um, so these numbers are because of the 10%, wow. which, which to me, 10% compared to 90% is a really relatively small number. I mean, I, I understand it turns out to be, you know, millions of people in the country, but 
if 90% of us are not doing this, we need to align ourselves together and work together. Men, women, all walks of life. I don't care, LGBTQ, Republican, Democrat, rich, poor. Well, I don't care. If you're a human being and you're part of the 90%, we need to push back on that 10%. That 10% is causing horrible things to happen in this country. I don't know if people know this, but 73% of all people who seek gastric bypass surgery have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And, and their eating disorders started from a sexual trauma. 75% of all women in drug and alcohol treatment centers have, have been sexually assaulted. So the, the, the consequences of sexual abuse and sexual assault are, are, are big. Suicide, um, domestic violence, cutting, drug and alcohol addiction, depression, the, the 10% is, is doing a lot of harm to this country, is what I'm saying. And as a 90%, we, we have to join together and push back on the 10%. And that's what my hope is to do, and that's what my campaign is about, is getting the 90% to push back on the 10%. And the reason I focus on football, and you know, I've talked about this before, but, um, you know, football, during the football season in college campuses, there's a thing called the red zone. And so from the beginning of school until Thanksgiving, that's when over 50% of all sexual assaults happen happens during the football season. The other thing that happens is on D1 home game days, there's a 41% increase in reports of rape on D1 home game days. Um, also increases on away games. So football is kind of a lot of these things that are happening during their season. Um, and, if, and if we talk about night games, the night games are horrible. I was just at Michigan and, and the campus police and other people are saying, like, we're tapped out. We're maxed out on our resources for night games. People are drinking all day. There's a lot of domestic violence. There's a lot of sexual assault going on. Um, all this is happening during football. So I, I want to see football and say, you know what, we're, we're going to handle this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to push back on it. We're going to be the solution. Yeah. I, th- those numbers are, are staggering, right? And to me, you know, the one that I remember last year, um, not only is it one in five women on college campuses, but the 40% uptick when you've got a home game. And you're saying, like, a, a game is supposed to be and, – and I'm a purist of football of – you know, this, the, the ultimate team game, I truly believe in this country, is football. It's when 11 guys have to do their job on every given snap. And within and surrounding the ultimate team game can be the one of the worst offenses can be done. Not due to that game, but that game has clearly sparked a big crowd and a lot of enjoyment and some clearly some drinking and some inappropriate behavior. And, and to me, that's... Yeah. That, that's the worst thing, right? That's not what football represents. R- football represents showing up for your teammates on the field and off the field. And I feel that when you've talked to specifically college football players, when they hear that, they're like, yeah, that's right. Like, this is my job to walk into a locker room and be like, yo, man, we don't talk that way or hey, we, we don't do that on this team. Have you felt, and, and I'm not asking for specifics, but okay, you give your speech and it rocks a team, a locker room, an athletic department. To me, the true change is that three, six, nine, twelve, eighteen months later, have you felt that it's really shifted culture? Have you continued to hear from people now? You've been doing this for a couple of years now. After you've walked in and given a speech to a locker room, yeah, I, I do. I do think there's change. I mean, I think it's it's hard to quantify it, obviously, but I'm still in touch with guys that I met you know, years ago and talked to. Um, and, and I think that in a lot of times, you know, I read articles and I, I'll hear my language in another person. Mm-hmm. And I think, oh, wow, I, I said that. And I talked to that person. Um, and so you, you do see some of it. Um, and I also think that people are becoming more aware and conscious of these things, like language and other things. And I, and I know for a fact I've had guys tell me, he like, um, you know, in our locker room, a guy will say something and say, well, do you remember what Miss, Miss Tracy said or Miss Brenda? Um, or they'll kind of check a guy on, on something. And so I know that there's a lot of awareness. I know that people are, are feeling more free to talk about it and to get engaged and, and paying more attention to the education. Because one of the things I talk to my guys about a lot, too, is a lot of times you have guys kind of sit in the room and they kind of do like they check a box, right? So the consent educator will come in and they'll be like, I don't have a problem with consent. They don't even listen. But with the set expectation campaign, if you're part of the 90% and you're part of the solution, right, then you need to understand what consent is because you might know what it is, but the guy next to you might not know. And if you're going to be the 90%, you're going to be an ambassador for the campaign, then you're going to be out there educating and mentoring 
and influencing other people. So I know for a fact that after I've left, I've had more engagement um, with these guys in learning um, and actively wanting to be part of the solution. And I've heard back from, from programs and from educators saying, you know, thank you for coming in. You sparked a fire under them. They're inspired. They're more engaged. They're not, you know, they're taking this more seriously. Um, and that means a lot to me. And I know that that's just going to grow and keep on going. So, yeah, I know I can't quantify the shift, but it's happening. We didn't used to have set the expectation football game. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's huge. I mean, I, I, I want to ask you a, cu- a couple more before we get, at, get out of here, but I'll never forget this for as, as long as I live. We were at the opening, and you give your speech, and it's 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 amazing, right? And, and people can watch it on the NFL Network or Elite11.com and, and check it out. Um, and as that day went on, I would, you know, you and I were hanging on the sideline during practice, and then I'd kind of drift away and go coach up a drill or something. And I'd look back, and there'd be one person around you, and then two and then 20, and then 40. And that just kind of happened over the course of the next 48 hours. And I say that because following those meetings, I'll never forget the next day I'm in a meeting room with a position group. And they don't realize that I'm in there because I'm kind of sitting down back in the corner. And they start talking about women. And they're talking to other college athletes and asking about what are the women like on their campus. And it doesn't get inappropriate, but it's, it's definitely going down that road. So I, I insert myself into the conversation and say, hey, uh, Guys, what did we learn yesterday from from Brenda? And we end up having this incredible dialogue. And I stay after with one of the running backs, uh, one of the athletes, and I said, uh, do you have a girlfriend? And he goes, yeah. And I said, have you asked her? Uh, and I said, do you guys have sex? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how, how did you, you know, did you talk to her about it? Did you ask her? And he goes, no, I, I didn't. He goes, it just kind of happened. And I said, well, th- that that's sexual assault. Like, you got to start having these conversations. And, and the eyes of that student athlete opened so big because he paired your conversation where he was listening to, but never felt he was maybe a, a part of that because there's no way he would ever commit a crime like that. And then all of a sudden to have the real conversation with me one-on-one and say, Hey man, uh, you, you've got to ask for consent. You got to have uncomfortable conversations and you need to be the expectation. Cause you signed this pledge. I, I literally had the pledge right in front of him that he just signed. And it was one of the, the realest moments I've ever had with a young man of him saying, yeah, like, oh my God, like I got to make sure I, I alter my behavior. He and I now talk every other week and he's changed his locker room. He's changed his dynamic. He's invited the, uh, he's told his college coach where he's committed to about you. And I believe they've already reached out to you to come speak at their institution. Yeah. And, and to me, that was really cool to see not only a young man get impacted directly from your speech, but then get dropped into it and say, wow, like, yeah, I'm not a, a rapist. I'm not a criminal. I would never even think about doing anything like this, but I still need to change my behavior. And that to me was some, some real change that I thought you were a catalyst to. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's happening a lot of places and for a lot of young men. I think that there is um, a lot of introspection and thought processes. And I see this a lot. And I especially see it a lot with coaches um, and their staff. Like They'll come up to me after and you can just see their brains like literally ticking. Like they're just thinking. And sometimes those come back up to me and be like, I'm just thinking about everything that happened in college. Um, and I, I know that they're like looking back and they're thinking like all the things that they knew, all the things that had happened. They said something, they didn't say something. I've, I've literally had people come and say to me, like, I need to disclose to you that I knew about a rape and I didn't say anything and I didn't do anything. And I engaged in victim blaming. And it's, um, it's heartbreaking to hear those things. But at the same time, it's amazing that these people are having these conversations with themselves and with other people and having this reflection and being like, okay, I'm going to learn from that and I'm going to do differently because that's really what we have to start doing. We have to start having hard conversations. There's not going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who have possibly been involved in things that maybe you're not right. Maybe you knew about something. You didn't say anything. You didn't step up. Doesn't mean you can't in the future. Doesn't mean you can't learn. Doesn't mean you can't change. Doesn't mean that we can't educate, engage, and empower moving forward. Um, and it doesn't mean you can't hold yourself accountable too, and also apologize. Mm-hmm. Um, so to hear that type of thing that happened is amazing. And and the other thing that happens too is a lot of times a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I don't know how to have this conversation. I think my girlfriend was sexually assaulted, but I don't know how to talk to her about it. I don't know what to say. Or I want to have this conversation and bring this up with my kids, but I don't know how to do it. 
And I just tell them, I'm like, just say you saw Brenda Tracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's like a great conversation starter. Like, and so the guy will go home to the girlfriend and be like, I saw this girl, Brenda Tracy, and I just felt like I wanted to talk to you, but I didn't know what to say. And mm -hmm. that's it. Or a parent to a kid. I saw this woman, Brenda Tracy, and I don't know how to talk to you about this, but I wanted to have this conversation. Yeah. It's a great it's a great way to, to to start the conversation. And the set the expectation games are the same way, right? So a lot of times it's about how do you start a conversation about sex, about consent, about healthy relationships, about sexual assault, about sexual violence. Because everybody's very, very um unnerved by it, right? It's very awkward and we don't even want to talk to our kids about healthy sex. So how are you gonna to talk to them about race? <laughs> um yeah. but what happens is when we have people like me and we have set the expectation games and campaigns it's kind of a way to start a conversation. Yeah, uh, I love that. Okay, so what would you say? I'm curious. You know, that coaching has become uh, a huge profession, right? Tons of pressure, yeah. lots of money, big expectations on the field. Uh, I think b bigger and larger and more impactful expectations off the field. Specifically, I think the Pac-12 is kind of leading the way in that regard. But there's a lot of really impressive. Uh, head coaches and programs around the country. And I think the, the coaching culture is, you know, shifting and, and has almost completely shifted from that old school uh, mentality of, you know, demeaning to now really you know, developing uh, young men in, in a different way with different language and in a different community and one that you're clearly a part of. What would you say to, to coaches that, you know, want to have these conversations, but maybe don't know how to, or have had you already in, um, but but are struggling maybe to have the conversation after you leave. Yeah. So I think that for coaches, I think that, um, you know, you can reach out to organizations like, like Alexis Jones. She has a curriculum already um, for protector, right? You can reach out to her organization and you can bring in extra tools and resources. Um, I don't have my own curriculum yet, but I will at some point. There are uh, groups and organizations on all of our campuses and off our campuses. You can reach out to them, bring people in. There's different curriculums you can use. So really, some of this is just a matter of getting on Google <laughs> and finding out, like, who's doing this work? How can we do this? How can we keep engaged? Because coaches don't necessarily have to know all of it. You just need to know someone that does know something. And then you can, you know, bring them in or bring their curriculum in to, to help with that. But the biggest thing is be open to learning right? Do, do some of your research, educate yourself, because your guys are going to do what you do. And if this issue is important to you, it's going to be important to them. If it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to them. The coach is the leader. He's, he's got to take the leadership role on this. And it's okay to say, I don't know how to talk about this. I don't know what to do. But there's really not any excuse at this point today to not reach out and find those resources to help you, right? I mean, I have some of the language in the pledge. I, I do some of that education myself. Like I said, Alexis Jones is doing things. There, there are programs and people out there doing this work. So coaches just have to be proactive um, and, and willing to, to seek out those resources. I love it. Okay, so you've got uh, so much happening. You've got a GoFundMe campaign and the communities where they have set the expectation games. You did one at Michigan where they raised over $19,000 for the local domestic violence and rape crisis center. You started one recently for Stanford and San Jose State because you got the set, set the expectation game coming up this weekend. Uh, what else do we need to know? Because I, I think there's people like that that aren't David Shaw and, and you know Brent Brennan that want to get involved. Uh, how can people who maybe don't have that platform make sure that we can contribute to your community and, and set our own expectation and, and join your, your incredible tribe? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to get involved with the campaign is really easy. And if you want more information about the campaign, how to do a Set the Expectation game, sign the pledge, all those things, it's uh, www.setthexpectation.org. The website's there. Everything you need is in the store. Patches, helmet stickers, T-shirts. Um, I can be reached through there. The pledge is on there. You can do that. The GoFundMe stuff and the give back part of that expectation is something I just recently started. Um, every single community has a domestic violence shelter. They have a rape crisis center. They have, you know, a suicide hotline. They have an organization in their community that's helping survivors. And what we're seeing in this country right now is we're seeing a lot of survivors coming forward and sharing their story, right? This is a, this is a, a, a main topic. It's a mainstream topic right now. And there's a lot of survivors out there who are ready to come forward and get help. But we have to be able to answer the call. And 
these organizations need money. They need funding. They're not getting as much funding from the government as they used to. And a lot of people don't know who they are or where they are. So we set the expectation. I want to elevate, number one, who they are, where they're located, who people can reach out to in that community, but then also give them money. They need money to be able to help these survivors. The worst case scenario in this country is that we create environments and a culture where survivors feel safe to come forward and get help, but then when they go to that agency to get help, they're turned away because the agency can't handle it and they don't have the resources to, to handle the, the need. That would be the worst case scenario that could happen in this country. For me, if we think of the Power Five alone, and all of the communities are in the Power Five, what if every Power Five school, one time a year during this football season, raised twenty thousand dollars for a survivor advocacy center? That's like one point. I can get my math wrong. That's like one point three million dollars into the economy for these services for survivors. That's a lot of people that we can help. That's a lot of good that we can do. And that's just a matter of, you know, Michigan had 100,000 people in their stadium. Yeah. <laughs> and we raised $20,000. What if everybody had given a dollar? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the impact could be incredible. And I'm just really hoping that people will donate. Um, we set a, a GoFundMe up for San Jose State Stanford football this weekend. Um, you can find it on my, my Twitter. Um, donate. Survivors need, need assistance. Give $5. A cup of coffee. I don't know, but donate. I love it. Well, um, you know that you've got a lot of people on your side. I'm I'm proud to call you uh, a friend, somebody who inspires me daily, moment by moment, Brenda. And uh, we're here for you on every level, and, and we'll do everything that we can to keep you know impacting the next generation of leaders and learners. And and let's change these stats and and ideally end these statistics. And can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your yeah. story and sharing your time. Well, and I want to thank you too, Yogi. You've been a leader amongst men. You have you have taken a stand, and you have done it in a very um, bold, meaningful way. And I think that you've been a great example for other men that respecting women is okay. Being the good guy is okay. There's no weakness in that. You've done an amazing job of, of exemplifying what redefined manhood looks like. And I cannot thank you enough. I'm, I'm really grateful for you. Oh, well, thank you, Brenda. Um, looking forward to just seeing this thing continue to go and be on the squad. Much love, and, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. All right, you got it. There it is, Brenda Tracy. I mean, so powerful. She is, she's amazing. I, I've known her for a couple of years now, and she continues to inspire me and countless others and impact me and countless others. And I think it's always... Um, interesting when you meet somebody who's a paradigm shifter um, because it's got to be something deep within them, right? And this whole season on this podcast is about giving people tools to seek and uncover your potential, you know, dive into the humanity that drives you and, and what is that passion and, and go for it. And, and look what Brenda's done by opening herself up to the most vulnerable element of her life. She's saving lives, literally. She's changing lives, literally. And it's taken over uh, the college athletics landscape. And it hasn't been easy for her, but it's been so purposefully driven and a beautiful thing to observe and, and be a small part of. So thanks to Brenda for coming on. Make sure you, you you check out the links that she referenced. Follow her on social media. She's on Twitter at Brenda Tracy 24 brendatracy.com, and of course, setthexpectation.org. And uh, I think we can all take a lot from that conversation. For me, there's so many quotes, but I think the one that'll probably stick with me for the longest time will be, quote, I wasn't built to break. And, you know, you look at the conversation Brenda's in and some of the crazy, ridiculous things that she hears from fans when colleges are going through their own issues. Um, you're sitting there saying, come on, man, like, wh wh why, why would you even think that way, let alone type that and hit and hit send. And she just keeps showing up. And I think that's, that's who Brenda is to me. She's the individual who's going to keep showing up and fighting this uh, for as long as she can. And it's been as inspiring as anything. So thank you for listening. Thank you to Brenda again for coming on. Um, for all things on the Yogi Raw show, just go to my website, yogiroth.com slash podcasts. Um, and check it out. We got podcasts everywhere you can think of. Our last few conversations have been really impactful. If you've missed them, definitely go back as we continue to share stories, 
in and around college football as we are in, knee deep really into this season or on midseason right now. And if you missed anything or want some of my insights throughout college football, uh, sign up for the newsletter, How Great Is Ball Newsletter. I try to give you three unique insights from college campuses around the country. So that's it for now. You know how we end this thing. We always do it the same way, that the only limits that we have in life are the ones we set ourselves. Thank you, Brenda. Peace.